<laughs> call meeting for the Clark County Board of Education will now come to order. Ms. McNamara, would you please call the roll? Dr. Spangler? Here. Mr. Payne? Yes. Mr. Nunley? Ms. Wright? Here. Ms. Zellis? Here. Mr. Worthy? Here. Ms. Williams? Here. Mr. Huff? Here. Mr. Thornton? Here. Okay, thank you. We have any amendments uh, to the agenda at this time? Any amendments? I believe you do, President Worthy. Yes, I do. I have one amendment. Uh, for item 15, I'd like for you to add item 15, letter of resignation from Reverend David Nunley, District 3. I would read that letter uh, when we get to item 15 and give you some, uh, some additional information on that. Okay? That's a letter of resignation for Reverend David Nunley. District 3. Okay. Therefore, I recommend approval of the agenda. Okay. All righty. Adopting of the agenda. Need a motion? Moved by Mr. Payne. Seconded by Dr. Spangler. All in favor. Thank you very much. Mr. Superintendent, new business. New business. And let me, let me first uh, try to put in context at least the first items because these items are on an agenda and off the agenda, and they relate to uh, construction projects. And I know that's been certainly in the back of individuals' mind, and that is around SPLOS, SPLOS 4 and, and the certain litigation around those particular projects dealing with, with one, the SPLOS $2.00. Uh, as well as a question about the bond attainment. After consults with our attorney and determining priorities for our district, uh, we're able to move forward with several of the projects which I believe are, are critical at this point. Uh, we have the resources in SPLOS 3. Uh, we, uh, we have those projects identified in SPLOS 3, and, and therefore these relate to those items. In particular, they are, uh, as you know, we had begun and we're ready to begin the Whit Davis project as well as the Stroud project. We had to stop that project. Uh, gosh, uh, seems like a long two months ago. February. Is in February. Put that on hold. We also were in question about Barrow and we were in question about the uh, two new elementary schools. As you know, at the budget meeting, my recommendation was to postpone building the two new elementary schools, that's as a result of the budget, and we reschedule those as we see appropriate um, as, as we look at the budget picture landscape. However, it is, is my recommendation to move forward, and that's why these agenda items are here, that we do have the money and we should begin the WIT project and the STRAW project. Uh, there are a lot of infrastructure items in those projects that are critical, that are really costing us a lot of resources right now and operational costs. Uh, by certainly going into systems renewal, it will help us down the road. Plus, we have the resources. Those projects are ready to go, and our kids and our families, our communities in those areas, you know, need to have those projects going. The other, of course, is the Barrow Project. And we know that the Barrow School is, is, is in need of it's in need of work, and we've gone through, I think, a very good process to do the design work with the Barrel Project. As you know, it was our intention to move them to the Gain School. That would be for one year, and move them back uh, for the 2013 year. Uh, it's my recommendation that we move forward with that project. Uh, it's critical that we do the Barrel and using the Gains facility and keeping our timelines, and we have the resources. So the next items deal with all those projects and a few loose ends. So with that, maybe if there's any questions because they are related to these items. Any questions for, uh, for the superintendent well, think, pertaining to these items? I think that you've actually covered okay. one through nine, I believe. And, and you did say this was stuff that we already had. That we've seen this already. Yeah, we pulled, I believe we okay. pulled them off. We did. Uh, yes. yes. We got the same. Okay. Because I want to, I think uh, our questions were answered then. Uh, Thanks. But at, at this point, let me then, the, the first one is to approve the award to Ernie Morris Enterprises, the amount of 9800 for the work known as moving at the Barrow Elementary School. Okay, that's item one there, moving okay. bit Barrow Elementary School. I recommend approval since this is our call meeting. I would like it today. Okay. Moved by uh, Ms. Williams, seconded by Ms. Ellis. Questions? Questions from board members? All in favor? Thank you very much. The second is to approve the award to Ernie Morris Enterprises, Inc., in the amount of 9800 for the work known as moving at Howard B. Stroud Elementary School. Okay, that's item number two. Right. So moved. Moved by Mr. Payne. 
seconded by Dr. Spangler. Questions pertaining to moving the bid of Howard B. Stroud Elementary? Questions? All in favor? Okay. It looks like our bids are pretty consistent. So the approval of the award of the Ernie Morris Enterprise in the amount of $9,800 for the work known as moving at Whit Davis. Okay. Whit Davis. Moved by Ms. Wright. Got a second by Dr. Spangler. All in favor? Unanimous vote motion passed. I want to make a suggestion here. I don't know where it would go. But now you're going to item four through nine, and as you stated, now these have been listed before, and it's pretty much explicit. I've read it on the electronic packet. We have it before, before us here. Would it be okay if we just make a motion to uh, pass all of these items? I don't hear anything. Is that move that we we pass items four through nine? nine. Okay, got a motion from uh, Mr. Huff, got a second from Ms. Wright. Any questions pertaining to either one of these items? Just so I know for the record on, on these items, because it really is for the public. Yes. That these guarantee the price. That is, this starts the project. That means we approve the projects to begin. And those would be at Barrow Elementary School, Howard B. Stroud, Whit Davis, and then the other is there are carpet items at Old Gaines that we need for the transition. The construction manager at the west side, that's a pre-construction cost that we had a contract with. They have already designed that. We owe them that dollars. And the other is special inspection services. And that's, of course, we do ground testing for these. And that will include some ground testing work as we start to design the Park Central. Okay. Again, any questions pertaining to items uh, 4 through 9? 4 through 9. Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous vote. Thank you. Motion passed. Terrific. Item 10. And just a note to Witt, Stroud, and Barrow, your projects are moving forward. It's the budget. <coughs> Excuse me, and I thought I would go to here, just a lot easier to speak with. <coughs> kind of time to go. Let me just start out about the budget, and of course I was here last uh, last Thursday with the same same beginning presentation. And I do want to make a few comments before we, we go into this into this budget conversation. I said it I said it last week, I'm going to say it again uh, this week that that we are entering some uncharted waters. We've never, I don't think, in the history of this district, at least though, the town have ever been in a position to have the fiscal constraints that we have now uh, due to budget reductions. And what we're feeling is very, very similar across the state of Georgia. Um, I just was in Macon with colleagues, and you, you could have said first the same, really almost the same proportions, the same issues that are occurring. And I also want to say as I present the budget as superintendent, I present this budget and take responsibility for this budget. I had a lot of help, a lot of, of input, but, but ultimately that's my responsibility to present to you and your responsibility to either approve or not approve or to make adjustments. As I indicated last week, we can, we can see this up here, that, that we started after our zero-based budget, just to recap, that if we were to move forward exactly the way we were this year, our budget would be 120 million, close to 121 million. You see the zero base commission budget. And, and that's less than it was last year. Um, that's simply by, by uh, scrutinizing, and we think probably there were some other resources in there that we're trying to categorize. But this zero base budget is every, every expenditure is tagged in this line item. So if something comes up, it's not like we can just cover it. We have some contingency plans, but you can't just say, oh, well, we can add a teacher or two teachers or fix a $200,000 leak. Or, it's got to come from somewhere. If it doesn't, if it gets close to the end, we'll have to do a budget amendment. So that's what really zero-based budget occurs. And that's really only for the district services part of this. But the next, uh, as we keep going, 
but it's not 120 million, and, and we have to talk about influences on the budget. And I've said before the, that there are a lot of factors that influence the budget, but in particular, it has been a decline in revenues and some cost shifting of expenses is that we didn't anticipate. When we built the budget last year, we anticipated roughly a $5 million gap between revenues and spending. We thought it might go up a little bit. It was our hope that coming into this year, we would be able to close that gap to somewhere within reason. Because ultimately, it is our responsibility to close this gap. Because if we don't, we will let our kids and our community down if we can't, if we go in the hole. We can't do that. And we have to close this gap, in my estimation, within next the year after, after next year's budget. Because there's no longer a fund balance or money is left to compensate for. And by the way, that's similar across the district. And then we're just playing as how much savings accounts do we need on those rainy day funds. So when we looked at this budget this year, as you can see again, that that the health insurance premiums for classified is 1.9 million, the teacher retirement is 900,000, and the required teacher step increases are 1.5 million. We don't have control of those. Those are what we call cost shifting elements. That right there, as you can read, is somewhere around 4.4 million. 4.7. But here's the interesting thing. I went back over the last three years to try to determine how much money has this district had to absorb because of cost shifting. That number is roughly 8.2 million just in the years that I've been here. So when you start doing the math that way, we're already at 8.2 million to absorb in a budget. And then you take the, the reductions that are occurring in revenues. And we anticipate those are going to happen. We knew that the state and their austerity cuts, which started roughly three years ago, didn't fund the QBE. They still do not fund the QBE. And that roughly, right now for us, is about $9 million. You want to do a cumulative, it's, been, it's about $27 million over the last yes. three years. That money we have not gotten out of the QBE. But we've made do, and we've made tremendous gains, and I feel incredibly proud of that, and that's really because of the faculty and the staff and the leaders we have in this district, that we've done what we needed to. In fact, we've made gains, and, and you'll see that. But I know next year, at our current trajectory, we will probably have a $7 million deficit between spending and revenues, and that is if we keep it the same. And I know that we're going to have another $1.9 million in added health costs, they've already told us, and another $1.5 million in step increases. So what that means is it could very easily mean we have another $10 million to cut next year, just to actually close the revenue and the expenditure gap. And I'm telling the board, I guess, in my opinion, we have to do that to be fiscally solid. If we don't, then our schools and our community and our children are in trouble. And so that's what makes the difficult decisions. And I would place to those, in, those here today, those watching on TV and the board, what it really means is that we will have to step back and look how we offer our services differently. It will not look like the way I went to school. These will not come back, I don't believe, at least not in my tenure. They're here to stay, and things are changing. Some things are good, others are not. But that's the picture that we have. So with that, I've made a few adjustments in the budget that I presented last week, and I want to go through those a little bit more in detail, and then I want to address at least some of the other questions, so I at least give information for people as they think about you know, what we're trying to accomplish. So if I could, um, let's go to the, to the reductions. And I'd ask, I'll go through each one, and, and, if, and if, if the board member has a, has a question, please, please answer. 
And I also want to try to do some summary, some summary figures just to tell you kind of the path we've taken in the last, in the last couple of years. The, the, first of all, uh, we get it as a reduction. It, it's a good reduction. Uh, you know, it's the only good one up there, by the way. So take advantage of it. At least it's the largest. But the first reduction is in workman's comp. And that is um, that, that our premium was roughly about $2.1 million, and we were informed that it will drop to $1.1 million due to a lot of work of our safety teams in our schools. And there's lots to be said from going like to the worst and the most at risk to probably one of the top safety districts in the district. That's, that's gigantic. That's a lot of people working at this. We also know that we were going out to bid on insurance and some of the other things, and so that, that may or may not change. But we're guaranteed at least a million. The next one is, is uh, of all of them, there's a lot, they're all difficult. Uh, the next one is, is, is furloughs. And uh, I think every year I went into the budget, I was hoping to go back to zero. Um, thought, I thought we could do it last year, we couldn't, and, and this year it, it's even worse. But, you know, I want to, again, you know, thank our, all of our, all of the members of this, of this uh, community who works for the, for CCSD is, you know, they will, they will go from three to five. Uh, furlough days. We roughly have a, about, uh, I think, Ted, we, we, it's about 11, about 1,100 that would not be affected. We, we know that for our lowest paid employees, which is roughly 35,000 and below, which is starting teacher, we just taken the position that we weren't going to fur furlough them and, and our lowest paid employees, and that's about 1,100. So the, the rest of the furloughs is roughly about about 16, 17. Excuse me, 1,700 that uh, 17 or not. are not in for 1,100 that will be for all. Thank you. Um, the next is the high school is uh, 12 teacher uh, ratio change. We made some uh, adjustments. That it, have we made those in our presentation yet, or are they going to be in a different? Just right here. They are going to be right here. Um, one of the ratios that we use, we changed the ratio to to uh, tw around 26 to 1 as we staff our high schools. And I don't constantly mean to use other schools, but our <coughs> colleagues in Metro area, I just talked to them, they're at 34 to 1. Their classrooms are actually 34 and 35 students in their high schools. Um, our, our ratios will, will stay at actually, we, we've got our class caps at 35, but we use 30 uh, as, a, as a scheduling dynamic. I met with both the schedulers at the high school and um, we, uh, we, we max out our class loads, and, and it looks like probably there'll be a savings of 20 teachers. And that will be total between the scheduling of all classes, including CTAE and the Career Academy. I lumped them all together. There's 12 there. There's, uh, there's 10. Uh, we'll probably make that adjustment to at, at 20 um, at this point. <coughs> But some of the interesting things about that change is we know it's all predicated on what's happening on the Career Academy, the changes in CTAE and different pattern shifts. One of the interesting uh, observations that we made when we went through the schedule is, is people said, well, if we didn't offer the CTAE classes in our, in our schools, what would those students do? Where would they go? And I've said we had carrying capacity in our curriculum, either through the Career Academy or, or through the, still the range of electives that we had uh, in our schools. After meeting with them, we, we've got a number of reductions in some core areas uh, by tightening up our, our, our uh, scheduling uh, patterns. But well, it's quite interesting. It looks like we could add up to five foreign language teachers in both of the high schools because our students are selecting foreign language. And that's, a, to me, a little positive piece uh, that our students have selected those courses as an option. And we've also seen, seen some increases in the arts, and we're continually seeing students accessing the Career Academy, and those numbers aren't final. The across-the-board operational budget reduction, 2%, um, th that's district level, uh, and, and that's the process that we're in now, because when we said 2%, whether it's instructional services or district services or our office, includes you, the board, that we are right now looking at a 2% cut, but that 2% is the total budget. So that's 2% of all salaries that you have to take out. It's not just 2% of <coughs> materials. That's not very much. It's taking your whole instructional budget, including salaries, and taking 2%. That's where you get 750000 
So there's $750,000 coming out of district services. Um, right now, we have a number of positions we haven't filled. We're looking at contracts of, of uh, some of the software programs. We even had some people build some things that we can use. Uh, it, it, that 720 may not be realized tomorrow, or 750, but it'll be realized by the end of this fiscal year because that's that's the responsibility of the district leaders. But that's coming out of the district office. <clears throat> the first grade para pros is 32 positions. I know there's lots of conversations about first grade para pros. Um, a lot of some districts still have them. There are many districts that do not have first grade para pros. I watch everything in here. I'd love to have, but it's my recommendation that we don't have the first grade para pros. I think there's a wonderful opportunity at this time that we're going to need help. And if you look down the road, this is one indication that we have to look to our community members for volunteers. We have to look to the university as we brought yes. in a lot of people that have come and helped and helped in our in our in our classrooms. Now we're going to have to tap into a different kind of resource than, than we have now that we just pay for. It. I mean, we've seen that by the way when we when we minimize the inter uh, academic interventionists that we had two years ago because now we have. Uh, college, university students and interns working with our students, and so that's a great way to overlap services. We're going to have to look at that, at that, at that one arrangement like that with our parents. I would also like to make a note that in each one of the elementary schools, excuse me if I can. say is there's another resource that that's important to know and that is Title I. There's building level Title I dollars. Each school uh, receives resources for Title I, varying amounts depending on the number of students. Uh, some may receive as little as 60 or 70,000 or 50,000. Others receive $250,000 in order to use for things that they believe are important. It could be parapros, it could be teachers, it could be coaches, it could be family engagement specialists. We know, at least on the plan that our principals have sent for us, that in the, using the title of their local dollars, that in the elementary school, they'll add four teachers to our schools, 13 and a half parapros, 11 family engagement specialists, and two instructional coaches. That will be title one. At the secondary level, they'll add 3.6 teachers, three para pros, four family engagement specialists, and four and a half instructional coaches. So the total total of 7.6 teachers, 14 para pros, 15 family engagement specialists, and six and a half coaches. Those are what buildings decided to use their individual title money for. That's this year's staffing. Excuse me. Thank you. They'll be making that decision. Uh, thank you. That's a good correction. That's this year's staffing, and if that pattern continues, that's what it would look like. Or they may decide to change it based on this budget. That's an important correction. Thank you. The CTA positions, which are there as 10, that, uh, that is part of the total high school that I was talking about of 20. So it says there that it's, that it's 10 uh, and... and uh, and 12 as for 22 positions, the reduction, of course, will identify 20 positions at this point. The staffing allocation decreases. There are nine positions in the elementary school. One of the resources you get in the elementary school is something called EIP, based on students that need extra support. There are a number of different EIP models that you could use whether it's self-contained, reduced class size, push-in models, pull-out models. But some small schools have up to six or seven additional teachers to help support students. In working with principals, I thought that we've got a, a number of EIP teachers that we could use them creatively in their schools. That would help reduce their class size or do the kind of work. And, and so therefore, uh, we, we staff them just a little bit different um, and they've creatively will use the IP differently because it, and provide the same service. In the middle school, it's eight teachers. We said we need two per school, uh, and we've already met, and, and 
and those those reductions are already there. It's tight. The media center at Parapros, you know, we set uh, uh, there aren't in every in every school, and there was a formula that we used. There are 16 positions that are recommended across the board that we that we eliminate the Parapros for the media center. Questions so far? Do you know the breakdown of the 16 pair of pros in the media center for elementary, middle, and high level at all? Uh, I think we had that as, uh, where's Ted? Was it 10? Should be 14. But we, we 10, 4, 2. I think it's 10, 4, 2. 10 elementary, 4, right. 2. Because remember, some elementary schools don't, don't have a pair. Uh, uh, one of the questions, Dr. Right. Right. is the, uh, when you, the 2% reduction, is that for the district level folks, is that on top of a furlough as well, or is that just the teachers that are being furloughed? See what I'm saying? Let, let me, uh, I mean, the 700, no, that's that's on top of the furlough. No, when you do so five furloughs, that's everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You start five furloughs, everybody, me, everybody. Right. And, and then that 750 is on top of it. On top of that. Okay. But that 2% isn't salary. It's it is. cutting. It is. Yes, yes. We'll be, we have position. It's on top of yeah, it's on top of that. It's in addition to those are seven hundred fifty thousand dollar cuts that we have said they were not going to fill positions, and we'll have some reduction in force probably in the next in the next week or two. But those will be for a broadest category what comes under district services. But we're not asking people to take an additional two percent salary cut on no, top of that. That's no, we're just not. the basis oh, on which each okay. director is having to find yeah, their two percent, correct. whether it's their copy machine contract or whatever. Or computers so, or so it's not. Stuff. So it's not all personnel. Some of that not is equipment. Or, um, or, renewals, or a renewal or, contract, or can we do some things differently? A, a good or, example okay. is uh, one of the programs that we have is Atlas, and Atlas has served us well because that's our repository for all of our curriculum. That's where teachers access, and we categorize and align uh, their work with our standards. Well, thanks to our instructional technology folks, we said, we, can we do something different? They've developed a whole system and now put it into Google Docs in a very creative way. And it's aligned, by the way, with Casey guys and et cetera. So if that's the case, then we cannot, you know, we don't have to use that uh, uh, subscription and move to here. Same with Encourse, which is our, which is our uh, uh, lesson plan software. And same, we're looking for uh, iObserve. We're looking at that, whether we can do that, and that's our walkthrough uh, program. I, I, I regret and I'm very sad to see the power of polls in the first grade being eliminated. I would hope that you could work with the University of Georgia and do your best to try to have the support that they need in that first grade. Uh, I think it's vital and important in order to get a child off on the right track. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I mean, and those, that's the kind of work that we're going to need to do and probably more in, in a number of these areas. Uh, the ombudsman contract, as you know, we're going to two sites to reduce the number of seats. A lot of credit goes to our schools and even our behavior specialists, just working and teachers, working with some of our, our you know, students that are working through some issues. And um, I think right now they're staying in our schools and we haven't seen the, the influx of students through the alternative program, et cetera. It's, uh, I think, really good news. The elementary AP position, uh, I have decided at this point that I will not put on the list. Both the elementary APs and the elementary counselors, uh, I will remove from the reduction list. And my rationale for that is that if it wasn't a good way to make it work, and probably at this point it's not a good decision. It doesn't mean that we have to start working on how we're going to look at these resources again next year, but that's going to be across the board. But I want to note for the record on this proposal, that we will not, uh, you will not vote on those. Those, those will not, not be part of the reduction. So that was the AP, uh, the AP position, and uh, the elementary council position. The work study coordination position, there's two of that serve in our high schools and one in the ombudsman. Uh, those positions will be eliminated. We put some resources to put back in for work based learning just being a little bit more creative on how we might structure those kinds of experiences. What, exactly what is, um, and, and you work-based learning and the work-study coordinators, what were their roles? What were their 
Yeah, they assumed a lot of uh, different roles, and typically in the high school, we've, we've had programs that uh, students could go out and get work and get credits. Yeah. Some were related, some were not related uh, to, a, to a program. Um, you know, we had a coordinator, and, and, and there were there was quite a bit of resources. Roughly for the two coordinators, about $200,000 for those individuals, or 190 with benefits. And... Um, our feeling is that we, we were starting to tighten up on that because I think with people are in work-based learning, it needs to be really connected to what they're doing. Um, and even though it's nice to be able to go out and get a job and get credits, I think there are too many instances and in our mind, at least in mine, that they really weren't connected to the direction that they were going. And so I hope this grows. And I think we have to start to rebuild it uh, and, and possibly rebuild it than just putting a coordinator. So the uh, work-based learning, that was not and is not part of the CTE positions? Uh, no. Okay. They're on top of that. Okay. The, uh, we just see, I had to find my place here, sorry. The elementary counselors I've spoken about, those are not on the list. The reduction on ombudsman transportation, um, that is... That is really for students that are expelled. Uh, we've always made an attempt to transport them. Feeling is now is we're going to need help from their parents, whoever, if they are expelled, they'll have to find their own transportation. Uh, and that'll be a savings and estimate under 30000 With the exception of special ed, because we need to transport those students. You spoke about the locations, about the ombudsman program going to two. Right. And will the two be serviced by bus line? Is that kind of a thought for some what, of those? What, what happens students? is this, that we're going to place the high school at Baxter because that's centrally, most centrally located and accessible. Um, and then we're going to work closely with our middle school students on how we can transport. And it might be really depending on what the infractions are. And all the middle schools all go to the east side. So therefore, you're going to be mixing east side and west side. Well, again. No, we, we can either mix, mix them or one would go in the morning, one would go in the afternoon. Hopefully, yeah, we can do it that yeah. way because that's not a good mix. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I think it was brought up, but we'll, we'll have to. A lot of times right now, we've actually had students switch sides because we didn't work on one side or mm -hmm. that environment. But now it's the same environment. But we have the ability that one can go in the morning, one can go in the afternoon. All right. This may be part of the ombudsman contract. So, um, closing one of the sites, is there, and, and like I said, it might be part <coughs> of the contract. So, there was not, we didn't have a separate lease for the buildings that were occupied. That was, part of their contract. that was part of their contract. Okay. You know, and they'll have to work, obviously, I think they probably have a lease on the west side and they'll have to work through that, um, but that's their responsibility. Uh, the special ed teachers, this is again, these, when we do special educate teachers, some are identified by billing, but they're really district because we move them around to where you need. Uh, and those have to be reevaluated every fall, depending on what the IEPs and what's, where students are at. Um, we know that in special education, we have more teachers and more paras than, than we get credit for from the state. You know, it's, it's continually evaluating how we provide services uh, and how those services are written in IEPs. But at this point, and, and we're still evaluating that, and some of those may come back under that district 2%. But we're, we're still looking at that. But we'll certainly have two positions that we can reduce at this point. As well, there are speech pathologists. We have 17, Dr. Price? 17, then we go to 15. District services. I use district services. It's transportation. It's all. I mean, it's not just here, but district services. We, we have two positions. Um, in transportation. We have a custodial director, and that's one uh, supervisor position. By the way, when I when I put these numbers up here, these are salaries and benefits, and it's the whole package. So it looks large, but that includes their health benefits and TRS and et cetera. So I, I want to make sure people know that. Uh, and that's usually, uh, I'm seeing that about 30% or, or five, about 35. About 35. Right. So our certified, when you see a number for certified, 35% is, is I just want to make sure when you see numbers like that, it's not salary, it's the whole package. That's a good explanation. I've had tons of questions about that. Yeah. So, um, 
The secondary AP, which is really a district level position, we created that as a liaison with ombudsman with all of our centers works under Mr. Hardaway. Uh, we're going to eliminate that position. The summer school budget, we had money in the budget, but as you know, we've reduced summer school. We do a uh, real intense session now after CRCP. We'll begin those. It's just a better use of resource at this point. We'll maintain the high school. Um, but and, and some of our, is a 21st century grant, so we still have activities in summer, but it's not going to be as extensive and robust uh, as it has been in the past. And, and that total budget, using our title money, I'm going to say, Nori, some, about one million, one point, when it was in its full? It was about 1 point something, 1.2 million. So it was, um, you know, it, it took a lot of title money as well. The uh, social workers, we we looked at social work and nurses and, and uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and said we're just going to have to tighten up and, and do one less. And the, uh, same with the supplements. There are supplements for some positions that are added that were added years ago for the type of the position. We're evaluating those. And our target is to reduce supplements by 75000 The deputy superintendent, of course, is Mr. Hardaway. Uh, he, he, the actual deputy superintendent, as is with Mr. Hardaway, would be eliminated. Mr. Hardaway, though, would be brought back in a different position and a capacity half-time, but to continue to work because of his skills and, and the need to keep that open communication with the public. Um, and he feels all the parent complaints and still works in structuring support services, which I believe under his leadership have gained tremendous traction because they've done it collaboratively. It's very different than it was. And the psychologist I mentioned, the nursing is the same. And you'll see some of these positions when we do the reduction in force that are actually vacant, which means that we just wouldn't replace them. Is the um, nursing... Is that a, the school nurse, or is that yeah. a district level? Well, here's what happens is all the nurses are districts. It's quite that's interesting right. when you talk about, and, and that's why the conversation when it comes about district or, or building base, it really starts to merge. Um, some things you just put a district because they have a tremendous mobility. I mean, one of the things that I did when I first got here, and I remember Mr. Hardaway and I were walking, is that we had centralized offices for our nurses, psychologists, our social workers. And, and within the first week, I said, Mr. Hardaway, they need to be in schools. <laughs> and they need to be in clusters. And so they're out there in schools, working directly with kids and faculty in small cluster groups, even though they're still under district services. They're placed in those schools, and they don't have offices here. But it allows some movement. If we have to recluster them, we can, we can do that. So the psychologists and the nurses do interact with students. They're not management type positions no. there. And, and the only, we, we have a head nurse and a head psychologist and a head social worker and they all have caseloads. They all have caseloads. And they all serve it, and one of the things to wrestle with, especially with psychologists, they serve on their RTI teams as well as our social workers. They're part of those, 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 those school teams. Um, police services coordinator, as you know, that's, that was Fabian. Fabian, of course, is now chief. We did not fill that position. We'll not fill that position. Just to note, Fabian does it both well. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's done a real good job with, with balancing that. Um, we have one position we added and then take away. That was at the at the uh, H.T. Edwards. We added a police officer. They're not showing what the security demands and needs were. We believe we don't need it at this point. Uh, we're very fortunate this person can go back to the police force. He was on kind of loan for one year and, and will go back. So um, we, we'll, we'll, we'll remove that position. The ombudsman work study, it's, you know, everything breaks. I mean, we just saw our kids last week and, and how effective the work program has been. And we just have to cut it back in a few less hours, but it's still going to be there. It's still going to exist. Maybe we can work with some of our employers that will actually hire them for some hours as well. The Career Academy Secretary is, is it, it comes under district services, and the reason why is, and this was a real change, one of, we had a district director, and it's not reflected here in Dr. Lynn Johns, and she was a district position that did, that coordinated all the CTA, while well, we shrunk the CTA a different way. So we restructured her, and her responsibilities is a building level. So she is building, working as our, as our person at the Career Academy with kids, being like the, uh, the other co-director with 
with, with Athens Tech. And so her secretary uh, went with her, and the secretary that is that was there will reduce the position. But that moved a team from central office now into a building doing building work. Uh, element, the, the elementary receptionist, there were, those are three 50% positions. Some of the schools had an extra half, and we're just going to make one receptionist for all elementary. The district receptionist is, is our person. We'll need to work on a schedule. I think in that position, we have to rethink about it in terms of being able to multitask. Uh, because in this day and age, there may or may not be traffic. So you can certainly do a number of different things while, while still working and, and, greeting, and greeting our guests and getting them in the right place. Uh, secondary, the CTA supervisor, that's a point five position to help coordinate with district office around, um, around the CTA programs and that program. In energy rebates, there's some savings there. Ted can go into detail, but we can talk about that. So there's the proposed reductions. And I would note again, when we vote on the budget, the reductions will not be the AP. And there will be two positions less. Question? Uh, I have some because... I need some clarification between the list and the RIF list because they don't add up. So I'm trying to get sure. clarification of the, the, when the RIF list tonight is not complete. There's the difference. Okay. okay. All right. You have part of it. So, so like when it says high school, the 10 CTA is not in it. That's there will be coming. another okay. list of reduction in force as we finalize some of these pieces. We want to make sure we've got it right because it's pretty complicated. It, yeah, I see. And so, yes, the reduction in force is just part of it okay. that reflects what we're doing here. Okay, thanks. Uh, we just wanted to make sure we highlighted those two. Okay. Right. So that they're, they're striped in our, in our proposal. Thank you. Now, the additions look a little bit different than they have in the past because when you zero base budget, like I said, if something happens, there's nowhere to go. It's not like it's kind of in there. Uh, it's not like you just go to your savings account. And, and so we've added eight positions, teachers. We have 900,000, over 900,000 back into the budget and it is all about instruction. It's eight, $520,000 is unanticipated teaching positions. We have a bulge, we have an overage, something happens. Rather than do a budget amendment, uh, we have eight positions. I call them pool positions, and what that means is we have them out of pool to be able to give as needed. We also, to complete the IB program, we've added two foreign language teachers to the, to the middle school, and that completes that requirement for the IB program. And like I said, knowing that we're probably going to add five foreign language teachers at the high school is a real change in patterns of our kids selecting. Courses. I think it says a lot about where they want to go and what they want to do. The unanticipated support positions are really uh, parapro, parapros, uh, classified staff. It could be special ed. It could be a number of things, but we, we never know what's going to happen. We probably need it. Sometimes you need some temporary work, but we need to put $100,000 for unanticipated expenditures. I said we've got to restructure job placement and internship. I put $60,000. There's nothing other than it's 65,000, we're going to work with it. I mean, I don't, there's no big plan behind it, other than we had to put some resource back into it, and, and we said, let's start there. And build it back, connected, directly connected to our programs. If Is that related somewhat to the work-study coordinators? That sort of a, okay, that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, basically, there, we have four work-study coordinators. One is with special needs students. That's not the one we're talking about. There's one in each high school. And there's one at Ombudsman. Uh, and, and those three positions uh, will be part of the reduction of force. And then want to evaluate rather than let's just put someone in. I want to evaluate how we're using that program, where we need that resource, and rebuild it. And that gives us some resource. I, and I couldn't tell you today if that's a position or stipends or part time or contracted. I uh, want to try to remain open. The, the gifted teacher is, is 0.5. We made a commitment to improve the number, to, to increase the number of gifted students in our elementary school, and you're going to see in a little bit that, that, that we've added four teachers 
and even though they didn't meet the, the criteria with the number of students, but our effort is to increase giftedness and, and yeah. to have that giftedness in our students that yeah. we might not see otherwise. And so our position on that is some of the schools that were very low and gifted, if we had a gifted coordinator, we would see increase in, in the number of students that identify as gifted and accessing a different a different resource. And we're seeing some gains in each one of those in each one of those schools. And that allows us to complete that for all schools to, to increase and, and, and really identify kids that are gifted. And we might not have otherwise. Because when you allot simply by the number of gifts, it's really hard to grow. The learning management system is, is $30,000, and I, and I think it's worthy of, to, to talk a little bit about this in the context of what a learning management system is. Because as we look down the road uh, at some very difficult uh, challenges financially, and how we deliver services differently, and one, of the, one of the changes that's going to influence us most is going to be the digital world and how we begin to access learning digitally. Um, We've been fortunate with the, with the State Department that through an agreement, uh, we're going to be able to uh, put in our students' hands uh, devices. I hope one-to-one -one within the next two years, even if that means bring your own technology. But what that really means is that our students with, with, with a device and with a learning management system, which is a way they manage their material, can access digital resources and begin to access their learning materials. In our work with the state, the desire to learn is what the learning management system is. But that's going to allow our students, you know, with a device that can log into their learning management system, go to their teacher, and the teacher can push out their digital resources that they need. They will have an electronic drop, they will have an electronic locker, they will have a drop box, and they'll have a communication tool that's linked to Google so that our students, uh, we don't have to start looking at textbook kinds of resources that we know are expensive. And I think that's a, working with Bob Swiggin uh, from the State Department, the head of technology, and he met with us last week, came up special to talk to us, that we are going to be one of the models for blended learning technology that will set the stage for the state. Because I think the state sees that we've got to move to digital learning materials and can no longer continue to buy textbooks or those kinds of resources in the way that we have. And if I could go back even further, the state is going to launch a longitudinal data system, which means that we have it now, that our teachers can click on their class, can see their students, and when they click on their students, they will see their attendance, and they will see their test scores or when they were in Georgia. And when they click on their test scores, it will drill down to find out what areas in which they were strong, what areas they're weak. The idea is that we can link that to resources that are already vetted, and we, we're going to pilot that. We're going to be looking, Dr. Price, at those resources <coughs> in August. And we know that we're going to pilot that you can take those resources and push those out to a learning management system so a teacher can really begin to vet resources uh, and begin to hone in on what kinds of resources you would need to support a certain deficiency or a certain strength or for enrichment, uh, where I'm really strong. So we're moving quickly, but I see that as, as really changing the landscape for us. And that $30,000 is the state's going to give the licenses for very little. They've worked a contract for like $3, $3 a student. Something? something like that. And we have a little extra money because we might want a few things in those licenses. And the other, uh, you know, again, is, is our strengths program and, and, um, and the orchestra. We've, you know, even this tough budget time, we've made those commitments to the arts. Uh, we still have our art teachers. We still have our music teachers. And we, we have strings on the east side. We have after school strings program trying to be very, very creative with some of our resources. But we know that our students are taking So with all said and done, and, and Ted, does that reflect the change, the eight and nine? No, this was last week's presentation. Okay. And so we'll have to make uh, a, a change and subtract, and if we can do that. I think it was two line items. That's correct. Um, uh, because uh, we want to do a tentative budget that is uh, adding the 117271, if we could. As you can see, we were working on these numbers just about a half hour ago. So my apologies for not having it on that screen. Uh, but we were redoing some of these packages just 20 minutes ago. Uh, well, longer than that now. Um, so with that, uh, I'll have Mr. Gibbs to talk about it again to make that, that correction. But I want to go to the other presentation. Do you have it on your computer from Ken? 
we'll come back to that. I want to show one other piece. <clears throat> one other question, and, and again, I, I'm simply providing information. There's a lot of questions out there. There's a lot of information, some correct, some not correct. But when you go through budget reduction, it's very easy to point and muting. You didn't get cut as much as I did. Why not here? Those are all natural questions. I, I want to, I, I truly understand why people want to support what they have. I want to support what we have. And then when you get into it, it, it becomes, it, it, it just becomes very difficult um, because you want to hold on to what you think is important for your children or for your school. And, and, and I applaud that and appreciate that. We all want that. But I think it's also important as we look at cuts in instruction that one of the one of our successes is because you built a, an instructional infrastructure that that has teachers, supports teachers around professional development, has monitoring, uh, has professional development. It's going to be more important as the new Common Core standards come in. If people don't know, we have a new set of standards again uh, that are being introduced for next year, uh, and we're going to be assessed on those standards. So we have to put those into our curriculum, and that that takes a while, a long while. Um, but what I wanted to do is to go back, and I, I'm only going to use my my tenure as superintendent in terms of what and how we put forth a budget, because each year we have had reductions. And people haven't seen that. I mean, I think we've done a really creative job of, of moving resources to title funding, because it should have been title funding or some other federal resource, not using our own money, but trying to be really creative of where our, where our, where our cuts have been. So we focus on it. And I know people say you don't focus on instruction. I'm going to say right here, it's all about instruction. And that's all I've talked about since I've been here. And it's all about curriculum. And it's all about performance. And it's all about accountability. That if we have resources, how do we use them? And do we use them well? And if you look at some of our performance, you know we have to make some changes. And I, we've made some great changes when you look at our performance over the last two years. It's been phenomenal. Why? Because it's a total package infrastructure of what we try to offer. Now, some may argue that doesn't affect me. I don't like that. Maybe so. Some may be more effective than others. Maybe the person, maybe the, the structure we constantly evaluate. But I wanted to at least show a, at least a perspective about how we have guided our resources through the last two years, which have required cuts, yet we had gains. Or we've been able to do more than what we had done before. If you look in 2010, and I pretty much captured, and I'll show you where there's... Where, where there's a little bit of caveat, because not everything is compartmentized in such a way. But in 2010 in the elementary school, and the parentheses shows what we reduced. You know that we reduced first grade paras, a portion of them. And we reduced a portion of media center paraprofessionals. So the total reduction that year was $702,000. However, in the same year, we had in our budget, we put back in 15 elementary teaching positions hoping to keep our class size down that we distributed in the classroom. I think we actually, there were two that didn't need them, but it, we distributed almost all of those. I think it was all about one or two. We also added K-12 resource, uh, that's a, actually, that's uh, kindergarten resources. I believe it's K-1. Uh, there's an extra two there. Uh, it's K-1 resources. We, we felt we weren't in our kindergarten when we added kindergarten classes, didn't have the materials. So we put money in there so they had the materials. That's good. But you can see the net gain that, in fact, in elementary school that year, we actually put $300,000, $295,000 back into the elementary school program. In the middle school program, we reduced six teaching positions. That was pretty straightforward. It was $384,000. In the high school, we reduced six teaching positions, but we added musical instruments. Actually, we had another 50000 another year, but that means we probably lost about $234,000. And then at the district level, which is district services, and just so you know, the district services, I count transportation, central office, which is about 15% of the total budget is district services. It doesn't count school based administration. We actually, you can see, we eliminated family engagement, central office administrative assistant. We, we eliminated all our 49% staff. That was $240,000. Those were our retired who were back working in our office. Um, some of the reduction in general fund positions, central office, we were paying out a regular 
regular budget, but it should have been Title I budget. If you look at our, our, our federal, um, our person that does our federal grants is some RCA Green, that's federally operated. That has to be paid, that's paid with federal money because they monitor federal grants. So we made some shifts there. And so out of the out of the, the, the budget, we saved six hundred thirty-seven thousand out of out of district offices. Then we added back uh, an asset coordinator position because you know we've been audited, three years cited an audit that we didn't manage our assets, and we added some management software. So the net reduction at central office that year was or central central district services was five hundred seventy thousand. Now let me little, put a little caveat about 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 the, the district services. There are other services in there that got ads and reducts like district special educators or social workers. I did not include those in this because they interface with kids and I just couldn't sort it out. So anything that interface with kids, I just I, I didn't put in this in this chart. It would it would change. It would be probably more cuts, but I just didn't put it in. Um, because there were a lot of cuts last year for special ed. Um, now in the, am I in the next year? Yeah. Okay. So in 2011 and 12, as we as we keep going through the story, that that we reduced elementary was some enrollment shifts of $320,000. What that meant is that the previous year we didn't see all of the students arrive, so some of the enrollments were down. So we're able to not we, we, we didn't staff some of the some of the classes because we, the students weren't there. And at that point, we again worked with EIP and looked at some formula changes to use our EIP uh, resources a little bit differently. So there was a total reduction of, of $640,000. We then uh, put back four gifted teaching positions. And I already mentioned that for $256,000. So in that year, the net loss at elementary level is about $384,000. I think you have to remember at this point that our needs, we were cutting six and $7 million a year at that point in time and just putting things back. At the middle school code last year, we eliminated four graduation coaches for 256,000. We eliminated four business teaching positions for 256,000. We eliminated a school administrative position, total was 618,000. We added back half-time IB coordinators because of the IB program. We added a strings position for the east side, and we added back four foreign language teachers. Total addition was 384,000, and the net loss there was 234,000. At the high school, uh, we reduced nine positions, so not $576,000. At district services, we reduced six district services positions. We reduced two district administrative positions. We reduced two district budget assistants. We eliminated the after-school specialists, and we did a reduction in funding for the special ed coordinator because we could use that funding from, from Title I. Uh, no, excuse me, 6B. And so there was a total reduction in central office of 600, central services of 634,000. If we look at next year, uh, you can see with the first grade paras, staffing allocation decreases with EIP. Uh, we get the media center positions. We got a reduction in receptionists of 1.5 positions. There's roughly about $1.5 million in uh, elementary. We're going to add back, uh, we, we estimate that six of our eight positions will be elementary. We integrated a portion of our support and a gifted position for 462. So the reductions at elementary are 1.1 million, 1.195. At the middle school, we have a reduction of eight teaching positions for 520,000, a reduction of four media center pair pros for a total of 600, I, I guess you had 12,000. I think that's correct. Yeah. Not that um, but we've added back, uh, we, we said we could give two positions there probably from the pool where additional uh, support from the pool position that would be classified if we need it. And we added two foreign language teachers for 130000 so net loss there was 312000 At the high school, we have a reduction of 20 teaching positions. That is, uh, that's a $1.3 million dollars. For those positions, we eliminate two work study coordinators for 170,000, CTA supervisor for 30, so the total reduction at the high school is 1.5 million. Addition of support positions, 
we gave twenty thousand in addition of our contractor services for orchestra was forty thousand. That was for the east side. We estimate that total addition is about sixty thousand. So it's about one point four four or one million four hundred forty thousand dollars for the cuts to high school. At the district office this year, and again, I'm not including social workers and nurses, et cetera, even though they're district services because they're out of schools, or did I include anything with ombudsman or back then with the SOAR Academy? Uh, it just wasn't apples to apples. But there's a reduction in transportation positions of 127,000. The reduction of director of operations and custodial services, that means we collapse both custodial and maintenance under one director. Reduction of a district administrator for ombudsman that we had for 100,000. We restructured Mr. Hardaway's position for 66,000. We eliminated the police coordinator. We eliminated the district receptionist. We reduced by one secretary. And then you can see that we're naming those right now. We'll have some of those that we have to reduce another $750,000 in services for central services. That's a total reduction of 1.275. So if you add that up for the two years that I was here and, and for next year, you know, I'm just going to put in perspective, different percentage, district levels 15%, high schools a certain percentage of budget, but the whole structural budget is in excess of 74% of our budget. So it's roughly about 80 million. But out of that, uh, we have reduced the district level by 2,479,000. We reduced high school by 2,250,000. The middle school by 930,000. And the elementary schools by... $1,280,000. So I thought that would give you at least some information on how we've traversed through this difficult, challenging times, but we've made gains while we've done it. Making gains, as you see now, is much more of a challenge. So again, I hope that information was helpful. So at this point, uh, let me go back to Ted. Uh, if we can entertain any more questions if not I would entertain a motion and again this is a tentative budget this tentative budget can, can change again uh, until it's finally approved in June we'll have public hearings uh, those of accept uh, I, I have talked with the, uh, with the president of the board and he has uh, consented and he's talked with uh, uh, our attorney I would like for all the board members to have a copy of the QBE that was adopted from about 25 years ago. Okay. The elementary elementary council was in that. That was one of the main uh, points. Well, there were several. The other one was that uh, there was that should have been appointed a committee that would be functional. And every three years, they would evaluate QBE and make the recommendation to add to it uh, whatever needed to keep it. Uh, operable at the state paying 60% and the county paying 40%. That was never done. And this, where we are to, tonight, it's been a long time coming, but a lot of us knew about it long time ago. This is something that uh, the superintendents and, and, and board members are, are finding out, but this, this, is, this is nothing new. This has been coming a long time, and we're just getting down almost to the bottom of the barrel. Any other questions? Got one, uh, Ms. Thorne. Um, so you're going to put back on the table opening, um, proceeding to move ahead with the, the two new schools to be built? Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Okay, that's no. out. Oh, okay, no, that makes understood. You. One more question. Um, when we're doing um, the, uh, the budget cuts, are we looking at non-certified teachers. I know there are teachers that have not received their certification and I think someone asked a question before about teachers that have retired and, and come back. So how does that fit into these budget cuts? Um, first of all, we have to follow and I'll, I'll ask Bud to clarify Ms. Barley. Uh, now we give notices if you're not highly qualified that you have to be highly qualified or we don't think it's contract. Okay. Or if you haven't met this, the, the requirements for us for you to be qualified within a certain period of time. There are a few point four nine positions. Um, I don't know, and I, I talked to Mr. Hardaway, I don't know how many, if there are any full-time people that have returned. I know one probably is on a reduction in force list. 
Uh, there might be two or three out, out there, but I don't know exactly. And of course, that's going to end next year. That's uh, correct. And those are those that have come back and are allowed to teach full time after retirement. It, it, I know it's less than five. I just don't have. I don't, I don't have exactly. It's three to five. So, so, so. There's a time. So, if someone while we're going through this rift, and a person would have normally had whatever time it was to get the certification, do we still give them that? No. Okay. No, and really when I look at reductions here, I'm really looking at positions. But no, they're... What we do is uh, we meet with folks that uh, have not met IQ, and there's an agreement that's put in place for a mediation plan, and they're given a period of time in which to meet that. If it's not, then they understand that timeline, and those folks will not be offered contracts. But again, if, if the timeline is, let's say, the beginning, let, I, you know, I don't know how you do the timeline, but if it's after, if the timeline is after the rift, let's say we're going through this rift process, and, and they have six more months to get their qualifications, do we still consider, are they? Those folks will not be issued time. Uh, Dr. Lanier, before we move forward, because there's, there's so much confusion in the community, people calling, and especially when different information is uh, and, and, and the uh, budget proposal here with the local revenue. It says local projection of 4% decrease in 2012. And in the paper this morning, it said 5%. Uh, you know, the questions start coming. Well, I can't answer that. I don't know whether the paper had gotten a 1% uh, uh, increase from the tax commission or what. You know, but, don't, no, but that's... We, we're, we're revenues are, are all predictions. Right. We were told 4%, but, but that 4% could be 2% depending on the percentage of collections. Mm -hmm. so you collect the 98% yes. at 99% we, or 99.5%. I believe if we collect the 98%, then we'd probably see a 4% decrease. The 4% reduction in the tax digest, and, and we've looked at, we typically put a 98% collection rate Mm -hmm. Our collection, our actual has been a little higher than that, right. so yeah. it, it will range between 98 and 99.7. Yeah, and I understand that, but what I'm saying that with the projection of 4% and the paper stating 5%, and you know, people out there, they're keeping up with this. And when they ask me a question like that, I can't respond to that. We were advised for. Okay, thank you. No, uh, I, I would like to know, at the 4% rate, and some say it's going, uh, it's going up, and that is because a lot of people are losing their home. So th they don't pay taxes uh, whenever whenever you lose your home. And, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of, uh, some businesses have gone out of business. And, and, and you don't pay taxes when you when you uh, go out of business. And we know that fluctuate with those that challenge their taxes. There were a number of challenges this year. And we're, I guess, fortunate in some way that that reduction, we didn't see quite the reduction we thought. It was about yes. 300000 but it could be in millions. Right. We also haven't haven't got our QBE formula uh, for for next year, so we don't know exactly what that income is going to be. As I said before, just last week we were surprised that we did see an increase for um, for this semester, probably of about a half a million dollars. Um, I, I'm not. A, a, I wouldn't predict anything other than. Then there was some increases in there, and there was some money for math and science that we have to figure out where that goes. Um, but that doesn't mean we should just go out and spend 500000 we, we We know we were probably uh, at the low end of our predicted um, revenue decreases from, from the city. I think we put in 2%, we put in 2 didn't we? And it was 4%, so somewhere in between. And we haven't got... Our, our predicted amount uh, from the state that will come out, I hope next week, and, and I would hope uh, it's better. I mean, here's here's one here's one thing. I hope I'm dead wrong, and I hope I'm dead wrong about our revenues coming in. I hope I'm just off, uh, but I don't think that we will be that off. Um, but but again, it still fluctuates. We we had a prediction that was solid last year for revenues from the state, 
And the day before we've actually went through the whole process to vote on our budget, we lost $2.5 million. That was just a one-day. So you lose $2.5 million, and look how hard it is to recoup $2.5 million. Just can you clarify one more time the funding source for the instructional coaches? Sure. And there's a lot of questions about the instructional coaches. There's two levels of instructional coaches, and that's in our school. And I'm going to say right now that the instructional coaches in our school is critical to the form of the form that we have. Yes. There may be yes. different opinions, yes. but my experience is that if we don't have coaches in our schools working on, 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 on bringing in our curriculum and working with our teachers and working with our improvement plan, we're not going to get the movement I think that we need. So I want you, I put those as a high priority. But one of the, the pieces about our coaches is, is that they're not paid out of, out of our dollars. Nope. Um, people can use district resources uh, differently, uh, whether, it's, whether it's Title II, which is money set aside for professional development, or whether it's 6B money, or whether, which, is, which is special ed, or whether it's Title I money uh, that we get. You get some at schools, and we get some at a district level. We made a deliberate choice to build capacity by, by training within rather than just sending people out, like a lot of people do at their conferences or one-day workshops or bringing, bringing individuals in and, and they come and go. But we have, we have built, I think, tremendous cap, uh, capacity with our instructional coaches. So those aren't funded with our regular funding. That's how we chose to use our district money was to help schools in that way. And our 6B money we use... Um, Part of that goes to our professor in residence program because that, that is professional development and it allows us to do it to be really creative. Um, and we have um, six content coaches at the district level that, that work in, in the content areas. And, you know, they're, they're not going to hit everybody the same way. They, they serve a lot of schools. But right now, they're the ones that are, are, uh, are the interface with the curriculum, the common core. They're the ones that uh, put it in such a way they give it to coaches. Uh, but that's 6B money, and so again, rather than just do professional development one-shot deals across the board, Title II. 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 Federal money cannot be used to support the operating cost of the district. It's called supplanting. And, and uh, in fact, there's a district in the state of Georgia right now that got cited. I won't say who it is. It looks like they got to pay back 2.7 yes. million. Yes. Because they decided to use district money, uh, or Title I money, or 6B money, to, to supplant. In other words, to take the place out because they couldn't afford it. But it's not. Title I is made to use to support and add on in different ways. It's not to supplant. So we, I think, have been very creative of how we've used our resources to get the most out of it. Yeah. So then the other half of David's question, because what I keep getting asked is, why don't you get rid of instructional coaches and use that money to pay parapros? First grade parapros are being paid out of local tax dollars because the That's state right. doesn't pay them, correct? That's correct. And we cannot just flip right. those two budgets because yeah, That's instructional correct. coaches are out of federal. That's correct. Um, to piggyback what Denise just said, a lot of the concerns and questions were revolving around the elementary school level cut. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the AP and counselor reconsideration. Um, along those same lines, you've got the pair pros and the library pair pros that are still um, being cut. And back, going back to what we talked about in earlier, Title I money, however, can be used it's to Local. fund pair pros should the principal decide? Is that a principal decision of what their school needs at their level? Is that? Above and beyond is to supplement okay. whatever the district allots as far as staffing. So you can't say the 32 pair pros that are being cut, we now can use Title I. Sure. But you can say the funding that I'm getting, I can buy pair pros. And as a matter of fact, this past year, we had 15 positions that were purchased with Title I money, and they were paraprofessional. Yeah, and seven, the seven yes, and a half teachers. local schools can evaluate what their needs are. And, and that's a principal-based decision. Well, it's their school inclusion leadership team, uh -huh. um, and then they have to get input from parents. So at their Title I um, mm -hmm. annual meeting, right, in the they share that information with parents, and parents can give feedback. Okay. 
and how and the amount of dollars that each school you said between 60 and 250 and that is the dependent percentage? on free and reduced lunch yes. that's right okay about 90% of our students on that so are we eliminating the first grade pair pros in such a way that title 1 dollars could be Used for that? No. no. Not, if you just no, not at the district. Well, once we eliminate, if someone at the building level wants to. But, but we're doing it in such a way that they could do that without it being supplanting. In the way that we yes. did that with yes. the position yes. last year yes. when we cut the program right. and then they could bring That's it back. Right. That's right. So, I couldn't, so the couldn't, way we're gonna do is, it. couldn't cut half and then pay the half with the title right. money. That right. would be right. supplanting. Right. So that since they're all gone, they, then that opens the door for them to do that. Unlike when we went from one per room to one for every two rooms. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> so therefore that what I'm asking at this point is uh, proposing a tentative budget of $117,979,300. You making that recommendation, I, Dr. Levin? Worthy I am. Okay. Recommendation from the superintendent and do know board members, public, that this is the tentative budget. The final budget would not be voted on until June the 14th, I believe. Okay, do I have a motion for the move by Dr. Spangler? Seconded by Mr. Huff. Any questions about the tentative budget? Any questions? All in favor of the tentative budget? Raise your right hand, please. Okay, is that a unanimous vote? I believe it is. Thank you. Motion passed. <laughs> okay, item. Uh, item. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, will we get updated copies of yes. the changes because I'm trying to keep everything. I will give updated the changes and the slides about the three year history. I'll get those to you tomorrow morning. Okay, item uh, 11. Now, obviously, every year we have to uh, we have to adopt the millage rate. I recommend that we adopt for the FY 2013 tentative millage rate of 20 mills. And that's what we 20 mills is what we currently are at. Okay. So move. Moved by Ms. Payne. Got a second on that second by Dr. Spangler. Any questions about the recommendation from the superintendent on uh, tentative uh, millage rate, which is uh, 20 mils? Any question? All in favor? Thank you very much. Motion passed. Down to item 12. Um, these, of course, are our... The next, of course, is the reduction in force. That's according to policy. There are some options. I will present reductions in force for park. In fact, some of that, some of this is even a little more in here because it's part of the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars that we already went ahead and did. But, but the reduction in force, uh, I tried to take the, the broadest net and do district wide. Uh, then I matched it down to level. Because if we do a RIF, there are certain individuals that are better suited for elementary, middle, and high. So a district-wide level mm -hmm. means it's district-wide, but at elementary or at middle, at high. Mm -hmm. There are some positions that are district by program, i.e., uh, um, would be like social work, which is the whole program. There are other positions that, they're an administrative position, are not entitled to a reduction in um, I want you to know that for any position or person that is re reduced in force, I've, I've said that we will look at certification and I would look at placing the superintendent mm -hmm. as right to place people back into open positions in which they're certified and qualified. Yes. Uh, I believe we owe that to our employees and if we do retraining, we've already asked them to do that. So I want to make sure that we cast the widest net and yes. have the greatest latitude to put people in the right positions and back into our organization. Thank you. And so we've kept that that clause. Thank you. So, so the first is the administrative reduction in force uh, plan. And I'm going to read it because I think it has to go on record. Yeah, 
I recommend the board approve a reduction in force, which includes the elimination of two certified and two classified administrative positions in the district. The conditions which result in the need for a reduction in force are a change in the state or local curriculum, personnel, or financial practices, which would necessitate a change in or elimination of programs of services provided by the Clark County School District, a lack or decrease in funding for programs, personnel, or services provided by the Clark County School District, a loss or decrease of funds due to a reduction in state or local funds or in the other funds that make a reduction in spending necessary. I recommend a reduction in force be applied to the competitive areas and positions listed in Attachment A. Seniority here is not a consideration. Here's our administrative position. And I won't read each of that section for conditions in the next ones. This is the same. Pursuant to Georgia law, and that would be on or before May 15th, I will notify these individuals. The positions are the Police Service Coordinator, Custodial Services Director, Ombudsman, Assistant Principal, Ombudsman Coordinator for Work-Based Learning. If you notice that the two asterisks means that there's no one in that position, so those positions would just be eliminated. I recommend approval of reduction in force for administration. Okay, item 12, Administrative Reduction of Force. 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 Item 12,
at the high school. It's two special ed interrelated teachers, two math teachers, two science teachers, two social studies teachers, and four English teachers. The number of positions for classified is 32 elementary paraprofessionals and three elementary receptionists, which are 50%. Okay. Again, I would like to note that, um, that I will begin to place those when their positions are open and will continue to place those in positions on the reduction force up to August 1st. Recommend the uh, approval of the reduction force for elementary, middle, and high school. <coughs> Cert 35, certified 35, 33.5 classified. Okay, that's item 14 for the elementary, middle, and high school reduction in force. Okay, I need a motion on that. Moved by Mr. Huff. Got a second on that. Got a second on that. Seconded by uh, Dr. Spangler. Questions pertaining to the district level, elementary, middle, high school reduction in force plan. Questions? I have a question about the special ed. Um, that's been an area that we've continued to struggle in test scores. And can you speak on that just a little bit? The sure. Of the special ed teachers. You know, I, and I think when we struggle on on, on scores, the, the question really is not how many people we have, but what are we doing? And, and much of our focus has been um, to look at the instructional practices, which is our which is our our co-teaching and co-lab classes, but this. Reason is more around to us about instructional practices, writing IEPs that uh, align to a student's exceptionality. Um, I don't believe we were doing that with the effectiveness we needed. We probably, in some ways, had more people than we needed because we weren't effective. So, to us, this is not about a personnel issue. This is about a pedagogical matter, and that's what we've been working on. Okay. Any any further questions? Uh, Dr. Liu, I, I really don't have a question, but I have a comment. I feel I need to say this. I'm looking at the high school, and I know you just read that you try to play, replace these people up until August 1st, I believe, mm -hmm. if, if you can. But I'm looking at the math, two math uh, teachers at the high school level and also four English teachers at the high school level, and students having to take those courses for four years. Sure. And if we're not able to do that, how are those numbers going to look in those classes? Right. Well, That's what I'm concerned. Sure, about. and we looked at that. We went through all of the numbers. We, we met with the schedulers uh, and, and went through the numbers. We've also had some shifts in one of the high schools that, that we don't offer English, uh, ninth grade English, for a whole year. And in fact, they moved to some of the sections. They only do it during the semester, and that was that support class. And the reason why is because we're getting better results uh, from our schools when you compress it and do it in one semester. So when we looked at our class size numbers, they're still very reasonable. Um, and way under our cap. So uh, they went through that whole scheduling matrix, and uh, we're fine. Well, I missed science because they, I, forgot, I forgot they're taking four years of science, too. But, no, they, we're still offering our students a full program. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments before I call for a vote on this? Any other questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? I'm going to word raise my hand on this reluctantly. Okay. Have we any Ms. Payne? <laughs> yeah, I'm reluctant to. <laughs> okay, any opposed? I'm going to oppose. I, I can win on this one. I, I, <laughs> that was tough, folks. <laughs> my head is <laughs> not fair. My right hand is lead in it. Make sure you find it. I'm a nice guy. Okay. Okay, we're down to item 15 now. <laughs> Good job, Mr. Superintendent. Okay, I, I said uh, we had an amendment, letter of resignation from uh, Reverend David Nunley, District 3. I'm going to read this letter, and this letter was uh, addressed to the Honorable uh, Nathan Deal, Governor of Georgia. Dear Governor Deal, it is regret that I'm writing informing you to uh, informing you of my decision to resign from my position as District 3 Board Representative, Clark County School District, Athens, Georgia effective immediately. Since 1992, I have done my best to represent and serve District 3 faithfully and affordably. However, due to changes in my health conditions beyond my control, I feel that it's time for me to resign gracefully from the position and allow someone else who has the time and energy the opportunity to represent and serve the people of the uh, district. I, it has been my pleasure to serve under your leadership and alongside my fellow board members 
if I can be of any assistance during the time it would take to fill the position, please do not hesitate to answer. And this was uh, signed by David Nunley Sr. I have spoken with our attorney, Mr. Benton, about this. In fact, I called him in Boston this morning. And what he's going to do at our next regular board member meeting, rather, he is going to uh, lead us through a process in terms of how do we go about uh, replacing uh, Mr. Nunley in District 3. And I can tell you right now, it won't be an election there, okay? But he's going to give us different options in terms of what we're going to do, okay? Okay, Mr. Superintendent, executive do you, session. Do you need to accept that for the board? No, no not yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I ask at this point that we go into executive uh, session for the purpose of legal matters, personnel, and, and real estate. Okay, I need a motion to go into executive session. Motion, moved by Dr. Spangler. What? Moved by Mr. Hunt. You want to second it, Dr. Spangler? All in favor? All in favor. Okay, thank you. Thank you.